African military history is one of the most underdeveloped and unexplored topics in our history books today, perhaps because it's assumed we already know the full story. Unfortunately, that couldn't be further from the truth. An old African proverb had it right the whole time, until the lions have their own historians. Tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. <laughs> What up, African world? It's Home Team here, and I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And remember, if you want access to sources, courses, exclusive videos, or if you simply just want to support the Home Team, you can do so on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Today, the line will tell its tale with a top 10 list as we discuss the neglected military victories of African kingdoms and empires against foreign invaders. So let's get right into it. For number 10, I thought I'd start off slow with a symbolic victory. Symbolic victories are underappreciated at times when it comes to world history, but it's still noteworthy. The War of the Golden Stool was probably the greatest symbolic victory in West African history. Even though the Ashanti lost their sovereignty in the back and forth battles of the Anglo-Ashanti Wars, the British still pushed to gain a stronghold over the Ashanti by demanding that a European possess the golden throne of the Ashanti. The Ashanti Golden Stool was a living embodiment of the Ashanti state and the very symbol of the Ashanti peoples, living, dead, and yet to be born. This was the worst possible offense anyone can commit against the Ashanti. Immediately, Ya Asantewe, queen mother of the Ashanti, rallied the troops with the goal of protecting the Golden Throne. Many casualties took place on both sides, but the Ashanti were successful in their pre-war goal to protect the Golden Stool, the living embodiment of African pride. The British never did get that stool, as the Ashanti ultimately maintained the essential integrity of their socio-political system. Coming in at number 9, we have the Ajuran Empire. Now this may surprise some of you as it's high on the list because of the significance of Ajuran and their exceptional naval capacity, one of the few Africans to actually do so. Even though the Portuguese successfully took the city of Barawa in Somalia, Somali forces continued to fight relentlessly and the Portuguese couldn't even occupy it. The Portuguese again tried to flex their muscles by sailing and taking the city of Mogadishu, which was one of the wealthiest cities in Africa at the time. A naval battle ensued, and a Somali-Ottoman alliance was able to drive the Portuguese from key cities along the African coast. The Ajuran portuguese Wars was one of the first naval battles between an African force and a European power, and the political acumen and naval prowess of the Somali drove them to victory. For number 8, we have New Kingdom Egypt. The Egyptians probably had the weakest military in all of African history. It seemed as though everyone who even thought of conquering Egypt did so. The Hyksos, Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, and the list just goes on and on. But of course, at times, the Egyptians had their glory, and their most glorious victory had to be against the Hyksos. Ironically, the Hyksos were militarily superior to the Egyptians in nearly every way. They employed horse-drawn chariots, which gave them greater mobility than the Egyptian infantry. Contrary to popular belief, horses were in rare use amongst the Egyptians militarily during this time. Also, the bronze helmets, armor, and weapons of the Hyksos gave them a clear advantage over the Egyptians. Softer copper weapons and near-naked infantry protected by hide shields. The Hyksos ruled northern Egypt for about a century until Pharaoh Amos completed the reconquering of northern Egypt and finally expelled Hyksos, bringing about a military revolution in Egypt and the most popular reference in Egyptian history, the New Kingdom. The Egyptians taking back Egypt from the Hyksos was one of the most pivotal victories the Egyptians could have accomplished militarily. For number 7, we have the Congo Empire. There's no doubt that Congo fell because of civil unrest due to the Mani Congo, or the Kings of Congo. 
The kings of Congo were absolutely obsessed with the goods and services of the Portuguese, even to the detriment of their own people. However, one of the first times the Portuguese tried to cross Congo militarily ended in complete slaughter. Portugal recently aligned themselves with the Mbangala, a ruthless African army in the region. They were basically the Zulus of the area. Portugal gained some territory in Angola at the Battle of Mbumbi, killing the ruler of Mbumbi and enslaving some of the population, sending them all the way to Brazil. The only problem, however, was that Mbumbi was a territory of the Congo Empire. Perhaps a miscommunication on Portugal's part, but nonetheless, Congo was not having it. King Nkanga Mvika of Congo was absolutely heated by this act, so he rose up, declared war on the Portuguese of Angola, and brought the main army of Congo to reconquer the territory and to drive out the Portuguese. The Congo army met the Portuguese at the Battle of Mbandi Kasi. There, it's reported that the army of Congo obliterated the Portuguese and forced them out entirely. Apparently, King Nkanga was so upset that he disarmed the Portuguese and even forced them to give up their clothes. In the aftermath, about a thousand enslaved Congolese were brought back from Brazil due to King Nkanga's flawless victory and protests. Ironically, King Nkanga was about to commission an alliance with the Dutch to drive out the Portuguese altogether, but he died before this decree and his son rejected the alliance. Next, at number 6, we have the Zulu. Now, most people know about the interaction between the Zulu and the British. Well, this one particular battle was important because it literally immortalized the Zulus in world history forever. The Zulu interaction with the British at the Battle of Isanwana single-handedly made the Zulus the most popular group of Africans below the Sahara. The Zulu are known to have inflicted the British with its worst defeat against an African force. The devastating defeat of the British at Isanwana forced the British to take the Zulus very serious and ironically hastened the end of the Zulu kingdom. But the Battle of Isanwana was Britain's first attempt to conquer the Zulu kingdom. The British wanted war and gave demands to the Zulu king at the time, knowing that he couldn't possibly accept. And so the battle begun. The Zulu princes of the battlefield had tactically outmaneuvered the British in nearly every way imaginable, which led to a decisive Zulu victory, solidifying Zulu pride and etching the memory of Zulu power throughout mankind. The Zulu victory at the Battle of Islanwana was quite literally the African victory heard throughout the world. Coming in at number 5, we have the Razvi Empire. The Razvi Empire played absolutely no games at all. As the Mutapa Empire began to decline, the Portuguese began to dominate the region south of the Zambezi River. Due to the failed social and political interaction between Mutapa and Portugal, many independent armies began to arise. The most dominant of these armies was the Razvi, literally known as the Destroyers. Their leader came to be known as Shangamire Dumbo, and he reportedly used a bullhorn formation years before Shaka Zulu. This actually might be believable because what he did to Mutapa and the Portuguese is nothing short of total domination. The glory of the Razvi is something special because not only did they have to fight the Portuguese, but they had to fight Mutapa as well. Mutapa being backed by Portugal, of course. Shengamai's first encounter with the Portuguese was at the Battle of Mwangwe. The Razvi, even without firearms, still managed to defeat the Portuguese. After this victory, the Razvi had to go through Mutapa and carried the day once again in total victory. From that point on, Shengamai Dumbo drove incessant war with the Portuguese and their African allies, completely dominating them at every turn, defiling their churches and even digging up their graves. The dominance of the Razvi over Portugal forced the Portuguese to leave the plateau altogether. Despite the technological disadvantage, Shangamire's tactical military superiority over the Portuguese 
is one of the most underdeveloped topics between Africans and foreign invaders. And coming in at number four, we have the Mali Empire. The Mali Empire was no doubt the most powerful military force in West Africa in the 15th century. And unfortunately, the Portuguese found that out the hard way. And by now you should have realized that many African nations completely dog walk the Portuguese right out of their region. This was largely the case because the Portuguese came to West and Central Africa during a time when many of the African empires were still in their prime. Anyway, it was during the rule of Manza Uwali Kita II that Mali made its first contact with Portugal. In the 1450s, Portugal began sending slave raiding parties along the Gambian coast. The Malayan vassal state in Gambia was caught off guard by both the Portuguese vessels and probably the fact that they had never seen white people before. Regardless, the Gambia was still firmly in Mali's control and these raiding expeditions were met with disastrous fates for the Portuguese. Many people believe that the Somali were the first people to engage in a successful naval battle with a European power, but that's actually false. It was the Mali Empire that first successfully engaged a European force in naval warfare, and they did it nearly a century before. The Mali Empire countered the Portuguese raids with shallow draught boats, successfully intercepting Portuguese longboats. The Mandinka devastated the Portuguese in these battles, inflicting a series of defeats against them due to Mali's expert use of poison archery. The numerous defeats at Gambia forced the Portuguese king to dispatch Diego Gomez to secure peace with Mali, changing the relationship into a peaceful trade-like exchange. Breaking our top three, we have Ancient Kush. Ancient Kush was probably the most powerful defensive military force in ancient African history. This is true because Kush has never once been conquered by non-Africans, and it's not like some didn't try. The Persians on the Cambyses II conquered Egypt at the Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC. Persian soldiers used cats as shields because they knew the religion of Egypt forbade harm towards cats. So of course, because Persia, like nearly every other nation, conquered Egypt so easily, they thought Kush would be the same. They couldn't have been more wrong. According to Herodotus, the Greek historian and geographer, Cambyses wanted to conquer Kush. So he sent spies to the pharaoh of Kush, disguised as messengers bearing gifts. But it was obvious to the Kushite king that the Persians were spies. So the Kushite king mocked Cambyses' gifts in front of the messengers and dared Cambyses to march on Kush. Of course, the Persian king was infuriated and in response led a huge army to Kush. Logistical difficulties in crossing desert terrain were compounded by the fierce response of the Kushite armies, particularly accurate volleys of archery that not only decimated Persian ranks, but targeted the eyes of individual Persian warriors. One historical source notes, so from the battlements as though on the walls of a citadel, the archers kept up with a continual discharge of well-aimed shafts, so dense that the Persians had the sensation of a cloud descending upon them especially when the Kushites made their enemies' eyes the targets. So unerring was their aim that those who they pierced with their shafts rushed about wildly in the throngs with the arrows projecting from their eyes like double flutes. Coming in at number two, we have the Kingdom of Makuria. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The reason why Islam was repulsed initially in Nubia was because they were soundly defeated by the Christian Nubian kingdom of Makuria. It was only later that the Nubians embraced Islam and began to intermarry with Arabs. The Arabs had taken North Africa and they seemed invincible, but at the Battle of Dungala, they were stopped full force by the Nubians. For almost 600 years, the powerful bowmen of the region created a barrier for Muslim expansion into the northeast of the African continent fighting off multiple invasions and assaults with stinging swarms of arrows. One modern historian likens Nubian resistance to that of a dam, holding back the Muslim tide for several centuries. The absolutely unambiguous evidence and unanimous agreement of the early Muslim sources 
is that the Arabs' abrupt stop was caused solely and exclusively by the superb military resistance of the Christian Nubians. In 642, the Arabs sent 20,000 horsemen against Makuria. They managed to get as far as Dungala, the capital of Makuria. However, in a rare turn of events, the Arab forces were beaten back. The Muslims found that the Nubians fought strongly and met them with showers of arrows. At the Battle of Dungala, it's been reported that the majority of the Arab forces returned with wounded and blinded eyes, and it was this legendary battle that the Nubians were called the Pupil Smiters. One day, they came out against us and formed a line. We wanted to use swords, but we were not able to, and they shot at us and put out eyes to the number of 150. The battles at Dungala shook the confidence of the Arabs so greatly that they withdrew from Nubia completely. And finally, at number one, we have the Abyssinian Empire. The Battle of Adwa was the most significant victory for African people against foreign invasion. Ethiopia's victory over the Italians was significant, especially because the whole continent was being swallowed up by European imperialism at the time. Ethiopia was the only region that stopped it. Italy had acquired Eritrea and parts of modern-day Somalia and sought to improve its position in Africa by flexing their muscles. King Menelik of Ethiopia ensured that Italy would not get their way, and he prepared for battle. Sources tell us that the Italian army had been completely annihilated, while Menelik's was completely intact as a fighting force and gained thousands of rifles and a great deal of equipment from the fleeing Italians. The Italians retreated back to Eritrea, while about 3,000 prisoners were taken. The Battle of Adwa was a decisive defeat for Italy and secured Ethiopian sovereignty. Few events in the modern period have brought Ethiopia to the attention of the world, as has the victory at Adwa. Our own scholars here in America sums up the victory of Adwa nicely. After the victory over Italy in 1896, Ethiopia acquired a special importance in the eyes of Africans as the only surviving African state. After Adwa, Ethiopia became emblematic of African valor and resistance the bastion of prestige and hope to thousands of Africans who were experiencing the full shock of European conquests and were beginning to search for an answer to the myth of African inferiority. When it comes to African history, it's important that we understand the whole story and not just what's advertised in popular culture. Well, I'm all out guys. If you like this video and would like to see more, you can support the home team on patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.